Hello and thank you for joining our webinar. Thank you for showing interest in the award of Chartered Chemist. This webinar should tell you how to um, fill out your eligibility form for Chartered Chemist and how to provide your final form and portfolio. My name's Kim, I've worked on the Chartered Chemist function for over 10 years and I'm here with Nellie Harvey who also works in this function. Thank you, Kim. My name is Nellie Harvey and I look after the accreditation of company training and development at the Royal Society of Chemistry. So, Chartered Chemist, what's it all about? Chartered Chemist is our highest award for the professional practicing chemist. We have a poll now, and this poll will just see how many of you already have this award. You could have a look at the poll and perhaps respond to us, that'd be good. So, so if you could. All oh, right, so the majority of you don't have chartered chemists, so we'll carry on and tell you how to obtain this award. Chartered chemist is the award that shows you have experience, in-depth knowledge of chemistry, expertise, integrity, professionalism and dedication. It will demonstrate to the outside world that you have these things rather than just the chemistry community. To be eligible for the award of Chartered Chemist, you must be either MRSC or FRSC, that's member of the Royal Society of Chemistry or fellow of the Royal Society of Chemistry. You must also have a master's level knowledge of chemistry. And you must be working in a job where you're required to use your knowledge of chemistry. You don't have to be doing chemistry at the bench, but you must have to use that knowledge. We have another poll for you now. If you could just indicate your highest level of qualification in chemistry, that would be helpful. How are we getting on? So thank you very much for um, answering the poll there. We've got um, the majority of you have a master's or a PhD and uh, some of you have a, a bachelor's and HNT, HND and some A-levels. So most of you have the master's level, but those you don't, how do we show that you've got a master's level knowledge of chemistry? It can be demonstrated in two ways. You may hold an accredited chemistry qualification at master's level, such as an MCHEM, an MSI, or an MSc, or you may be able to show it using relevant work experience. We do take work experience into account, um, and often people do develop master's level knowledge of chemistry on the job. So can you tell me, Kim, what happens if a candidate uh, has a degree such as a master's that isn't accredited by the Royal Society of Chemistry? So for non-accredited degrees, we have a thing called NARIC where we can look at the equivalents for, say, foreign um, qualifications. If it's a UK one that's not accredited, we will look at the transcript and from that transcript we will tell whether it's equivalent to an accredited degree. So if you don't have a master's qualification, what do you do then? So we ask you to fill out the equivalence form, which can be found on our website. And from this form, you need to demonstrate how you've achieved your master's level knowledge of chemistry. Is it difficult? Well, no, it's not really difficult. The committee will be looking for you to show that you're doing a chemistry based job, which requires um, things such as dealing with complex issues, making sound judgments, self-direction and problem solving. I see there um, it mentions dealing with complex issues. Can you just outline to me what complex means in this context? So they're looking for you to be able to deal with non-obvious issues and problems to solve. So problems and issues that have a number of different factors to consider and probably require additional investigation or knowledge gathering. Thank you. So how do we show equivalence? You can show it by referencing a project. You can do this by stating the project aim, we need to know the outcome. What did you yourself do? We don't want to know what the team did. We don't want to know what your company did. We want to know what you did. And an evaluation of the work at the end. And how do you do that if you don't work in a lab? 
So as long as you're doing a job which requires the chemistry knowledge at master's level, you can apply for chartered chemist. We have many teachers, patent attorneys, chemical publishers, regulatory affairs people. All of these use their chemistry knowledge. Um, so they're not working at a bench, but they can still show that they're using the knowledge. And you do that on the equivalence form by detailing your job and how you use chemistry in your job. So there are two routes to the award of chartered chemist. We have the professional development route, which we abbreviate to PDP. This is for the people in the early stages of their career, and it can you complete the award over two years. The other is the direct route. This is aimed at those people who have more than six years working at the master's level. And once you've had your eligibility confirmed, you need to submit your final report and portfolio within one year. So for CCHEM, the mentor is quite an important person. Everybody needs a mentor. This should be somebody who is familiar with your work, preferably chartered, and with whom you can meet regularly to discuss your progress. There is help for mentors on the website. So can I ask, does that uh, mean that they have to be a chartered chemist or a chartered scientist, or can there be any other sort of chartered mentor? So when we say chartered, we will accept any other chartered profession provided it is a science. So um, chartered engineer, for example, chartered biologist, not chartered accountant, as long as they're chartered in the sciences. And if you can't find a chartered mentor, um, we will accept a non-chartered mentor, but then you need to apply, um, supply a chartered referee. If you have problems with it, if you contact us, we can help you identify a mentor. Can I also check, um, if I were to go via the direct route, would I still need a mentor? Yes, everybody needs a mentor, and the mentor will be there to guide you through your progress and help you to identify um, the most relevant evidence for your attribute. And they also need to sign off against all the attributes and make comments on your um, suitability for chartered chemist. So we have another poll. This is connected with mentors. So we would look, just like to know now if uh, you have already identified a suitable mentor or not. Ah, so the majority of you, 60% uh, or so, have identified a suitable mentor. That's really good. Um, we do have some more comments on that later in the webinar. So the next steps, if you haven't already done so, is to fill out the eligibility form on our website. And you need to send this with your CV and the equivalence form if that's required. Once you've had your eligibility confirmed, you will need to complete the final report form, produce a 40-page portfolio of evidence, and that's the same for either the direct or the PDP route. But please ensure you read the requirements document found online before you start out. We have lots of help available for you. All the information and forms are on our website. You can email us at ckem.rsc.org. We can help you identify a mentor and decide which route is best for you. Can I just check, would you be able to assign mentors to candidates? No, we can't do that because the mentor needs to be someone who knows about your work. What we can do is talk through what you do in your day to day work with you. And while we have that conversation, we often find that there are people um, who can act as your mentor. Um, so we would initially suggest your line manager, but there are other people who you interact with on a day to day basis who would also be suitable, maybe a customer or a colleague or um, a collaborator or something of that ilk. If you would like to um, just let us know any questions that you have at this stage, now would be a good opportunity to uh, type in the, the box any questions that you have, and we can take a few now, and we'll be taking some more at the end of the second half.
So the first question has come through if you have uh, that we have uh, charter chemists and charter scientists listed on the website and this attendee would like to know the difference between the two and why they would choose one over the other. So the two are dependent on where you work really and what your work aspirations are. Charter chemists but well, it's what it says on the tin really it is for chemists and you they will be looking for all your evidence to be based around chemistry. Charter scientist is for those who work perhaps on the periphery of chemistry, so some environmental scientists, um, toxicologists maybe, molecular biologists, um, people who have joined the Royal Society of Chemistry because they're working on perhaps the boundaries with another subject but are no longer actually doing chemistry as such, they would go down the charter scientist route. So it really is your decision and it really does depend on what your career aspirations are and where you're working at the moment. I hope that helps. <laughs> I think it's probably fair to say as well that uh, many of our members like to show a particular level of competence in their chosen discipline and for that reason choose chartered chemists as opposed to chartered scientists. So that's something else to consider. We also have a couple more questions there. Um, someone would like to apply for chartered chemists. They have a, a master's in science and they're currently completing a PhD. They want to know what they can do now beyond completing the forms and sending in their CV. Um, so unfortunately you cannot apply for charter chemist while you're studying, you have to be in work because it's for the professional practicing chemist. Um, so what I would advise you to do is to keep an eye out on all the skills that would fulfill the 12 professional attributes and maybe keep an eye out for some evidence that you could use later on when you do apply. There's a, another question we've had from another attendee asking what the difference between a mentor and a referee is. So your mentor will guide you through the process. The mentor has to make comments on each of the 12 attributes. Um, simple confirmation that you fulfill it isn't enough. They actually need to make um, comments on how you fulfilled the attribute. And they're there to guide you through. And a mentor should really, if you can't fulfill an attribute, a mentor should be able to find a way for you to do that, maybe by organising a work secondment or suggesting something you can do. They should be able to help you fulfill those requirements. Um, a referee is the same as a referee for a job interview perhaps and um, we just um, write and ask them if they think you're suitable for sick and they don't have to make specific comments. So we've had uh, a few few more questions that we'll cover just now and um, the next one is uh, if someone is completing a PhD do those years completing the PhD count as part of the six years towards that direct route for chartered chemist? Um, so any work experience after a master's level knowledge of chemistry will be counted and that does include further study. So once you've achieved the master's level, so if you graduated with say an MSci, then all of your PhD will count. If you graduated with something like a BSc Honours, then probably the last two years will count and we'd sort of estimate that you're at master's level after the first year of that PhD. And I think it's fair to just follow on from that. If you are completing the equivalence report, um, the years that you would can count considering uh, towards that six years work experience would be all those years where you have been demonstrably working at or above the master's level. Um, so that would typically depend on the type of role that you were in and it can cover more than one type of role. So if you have those six years at this high level spread over three roles or something, that is fine to include there. I think we'll just take one more question um, about the time limit on what you can use as evidence and uh, by response to that we'd just like to say we'll cover that in the next part of the webinar but it's typically two years at the point of submission. Okay so there were a few other questions. Um, if you'd like to email in the rest of the questions or if we haven't answered your question or if you have a further question, some of them you might find um, we will answer in the next part of the webinar anyway, but please email us at ccam at rsc.org if we haven't answered your question or if you've got a further follow up on that. Thank you. So we'd like to carry on now. Um, and we're going to go into in-depth how you prepare the final report and portfolio of evidence. 
So hopefully this will be your definitive guide to it and we'll tell you exactly how to do it. You've still got me and Nelly here and we're going to make a start on that now. So you've just been told you complete the final report form. What happens now? So in order to be awarded CCAN, you need to show the assessors how you've met 12 professional attributes. The assessors are experienced chemists in all walks of life. It is a peer review assessment. So how are you going to convince them? So your competency in the 12 attributes needs to be evidenced by, first of all, self-written testimonials on each attribute and mental comments on the final report form and a portfolio of evidence. I don't know how many of you have had a look at the report form, but each attribute has a little box and in the box you write how you have met the attribute. Your mentor will be required to comment on an overarching competency. I'll go into more detail on that later. So what are the professional attributes for Chartered Chemist? There are five overreaching competencies and some of these are broken down into further attributes. The A set of competencies are the knowledge ones. These are based around your knowledge and experience of chemistry. This competency is broken down into four others. A1 is make significant personal contributions to key tasks in your employment area and understand fully the objectives of your work as they relate to the chemical sciences. A2 is to demonstrate a high level of appropriate professional skills in the practice or advancement of the chemical sciences. A3, develop your chemistry and other professional skills as work undertaken and career development. And A4, evaluate critically and draw conclusions from scientific and other data. The key thing here is the words chemical science and chemistry. You are applying for chartered chemist. So the assessors in under the set of A are looking for your chemistry knowledge and how you apply it. So if we move on to the B set, these cover professionalism. Now note there's no chemistry mentioned in the B ones or in this overarching B competency. So you can use other things here. So it's split again into three. We have B1, which is demonstrate reliability, integrity, and respect for confidentiality on work-related and personal matters. B2 is plan, organize, and implement work systematically and deliver results or improvements. And B3 is to demonstrate the ability to work as part of a team. The C competencies are about communication. The assessors are looking to see that you can communicate effectively and demonstrate influence in your role. Again, this is split up into three. C1 is to demonstrate good communication skills by writing clear, concise and orderly documents and or giving clear oral presentations. C2 is to discuss work convincingly and objectively with colleagues, customers and others, responding appropriately to alternative views. And C3 is to exert effective influence. Again, this doesn't necessarily need to be based around chemistry. But by and large, I suspect a lot of that would be. Now, D is to demonstrate an involvement in environmental, health and safety matters and adhere to the relevant requirements relating to your role. The important words on this one is relating to your role. So if you're not a bench chemist, you need to look at the health and safety that you need to carry out relating to what you do. So, for example, a conference organiser, if you're organising chemistry conferences, you may need to do a risk assessment for travelling to a particular venue or a risk assessment around that venue. So this doesn't necessarily have to be your traditional COSH form or your traditional risk assessment around chemicals. It can be around other things. And the final competency is to demonstrate an interest in broader developments in chemical sciences and make a contribution to the profession outside your usual job remit. Now here the important words are outside your usual job remit. The assessors are looking for you to show this interest completely outside your job, so nothing at all to do with your job. So for an example would be to go into um, a school and perhaps give a talk on various careers you can have in chemistry, um, or it might be to help the brownies with the science badge, um, it might be to write a blog on an area that particularly interests you, that sort of thing. So you've got the form, you know what the attributes are, what sort of thing do you write on the form? You have to put examples of how you've met each attribute in the box and you link it to the evidence in your portfolio. 
There are two techniques we recommend. You can use either the star or share technique to frame your answers. The star technique, set the scene, describe the task, tell us the action you took, describe the result and show how your evidence meets the attribute. Notice we keep saying you. Again, here they're looking for what you've done. Not for what your company does, not for what your team did, not for what your colleague did, not that you watched your colleague do it, but what you did. And also the other important bit is how your evidence meets the attribute. We don't need some random publications list that's not connected to any of the attributes. We need to know why you've put that in, well, how the evidence refers to that attribute. The other technique is the share technique, which is to set the scene, outline the hindrances, tell us the action you took and describe the result and how your evidence meets the attribute with your evaluation. Again, you still need to show how the evidence meets the attribute and it's still the action you took. It's very much focused on you. I think it's worth pointing out as well with um, completing the written sections using the star or the share technique is it provides excellent preparation for any self-reflective activities you need to undertake, such as your end of year appraisal with your managers or going for a new job. Um, it's a, a really good process to go through and we always advocate reviewing what you've written here and then referring back to your CV and checking if you've pulled out those really essential good points about the achievements that you've made and making sure they're in that CV. So coming back to the form then, when you're filling out the form, ensure you write in the first person. So the examples I've got are rather trivial, but they just show how we like it written or how the assessors look for it to be written. So an example would be, I carry out method development for the analytical department, a bit more of an example. As evidenced by my job description, I have also included an SOP. And again, you need to define your abbreviations, so standard operating procedure or process, authored by myself. Um, you also need to ensure the information is relevant to the attribute, and you need to make it obvious how it's relevant. So again, this is a rather trivial example, and we would expect a bit more than this, but just to show you the sort of way that you can write. I have developed my chemistry skills by shadowing a member of the process department where I learned how to crystallize compounds efficiently. Please see the sample page of my lab notebook, which shows this. In other areas, I have developed my professional skills by attending some courses. One was on advanced Excel, and I now use this program to follow the course of a project. Please see evidence A3.2, which is a certificate of attendance. And that would be for A3, which relates to developing chemistry and other professional skills. So could you just give me an idea of how much I need to write um, per section, per attribute or sub-attribute? So that's quite a difficult question to answer. You need a bit of information about how you think you've fulfilled the attribute and an example, I would suggest. So um, around 300 to 500 words at the most? So the, the box on the form should guide how big, it, that is about how much we expect. We expect you to fill in the box. Um, some people write a bit more and then they have to add it in as a word document. Um, bear in mind that communication skills is all part of this and the assessors will be looking at your application holistically. So they will look at the thing you send in as a whole. If they can't make head nor tail of it, if they don't know what reference what references to something else, then that is not showing good communication skills. And if your document is not concise and succinct, again, that is not showing good communication skills. So they will look at it as a whole, as well as at each attribute separately. Does that answer the question, Mary, do you think? Yes, I think it does. Thank you very much. So, shall we move on to what sort of evidence we can use in the portfolio? It's quite important that all the evidence is your own work, it has to show your name, it has to have a date, it has to be less than two years old, it must be reflective of the attribute it's referencing. I can't say this enough, don't just put in a random certificate without saying why it's in there and what attribute it shows. It must be labelled with the letter and the number of the attribute to which it refers. Again, this is about making it easy for the assessor to look at. It's about making it a nice, easy document to follow. It's about making it clear and concise. 
any testimonials you put in should be from someone other than your mentor. They must be signed and they must be on headed paper or come from the relevant email account. It's similar with emails. If you put in an email, don't just put the text in and say, oh, this is an email I got from my line manager. We need everything. We need the mailbox it came from. We need the to, we need the from, we need the subject, we need the date to show that it's a genuine email and it's not just something you've typed up. Having said that, please remember the portfolio must not be more than 40 pages long. We do have a few hints and tips for how to make sure it's within the 40 pages. And you should include a CV. That doesn't count in the 40 pages. The 40 pages is just the evidence. So your form won't count in the 40 pages. Um, the CV won't count. Um, I would also advise you to put a job description in. We can use that as part of the evidence, but if you don't use it as evidence, put a job description in because that will help the assessor to work out what bits are relevant. So for the um, attributes that relate to your role, they will then be able to work out what your role actually is and can see that, for example, the health and safety does relate to your role. Can you uh, just let me know what happens if my portfolio is more than 40 pages, if it's, say, 50 or 60 pages long? you'll get it sent straight back, unfortunately. <laughs> it won't even go to the assessors. When we read, read it in the office, we will send it back to you and we will advise you to take pages out. Um, there are ways to make it shorter. A lot of people put in, if they want to put in a report, they put in a full report. We don't need a full report. We just need the front page, which shows a title and your name and the date. Um, if you're using it to show manipulation of chemical data, then you might need to put the conclusions page in, for example, so put the relevant bits in. Um, but that's one way. Uh, another way is if people put a paper in, sometimes they put the whole paper in or we only need the front page again just showing that you actually wrote it and the title and the date. Um, some people put lots of examples of evidence in for each attribute. About one or two examples for each attribute is generally enough. Um, there, there are lots of little things we can help you with if your portfolio runs over 40 pages, but you should be able to act, um, evidence all the attributes with just 40 pages of evidence. So what sort of evidence can I use? This is all in the requirements booklet on the website, but I'll go through it and give you some examples um, here. So for A1, most people put in the relevant section from their current job description. This is probably one of the very few examples of a piece of evidence that doesn't have to have a date and doesn't have to have your name, but it will have to have your role, of course, on it. Some people put in reports that they've authored. You can put in posters or presentations that you've given, and you can put in copies of internal mail shots or things similar to that, which um, show your achievements within the company. For A2, uh, minutes or notes from a team meeting. Um, but that must show your contribution to the meeting and that you're there and if you've got any associated actions. A copy of your section from your lab notebook. Emails from colleagues or clients. Copies of internal or external mail shots. Or a publication list. So if you're using minutes, this is an example of how we would perhaps expect to see minutes. Again, this is a made up example, so this probably is quite a trivial example. So please bear that in mind when you're looking at it. But you can see it's labelled as evidence A2.1. There's a title. We've got a date. Um, we've got my name there as being present. And if you look through it, you'll see that um, there's something I've done. And also that I've got an action on there. There are a lot of X's on here. This is about the confidentiality. And we have another poll. Um. So this poll is uh, just asking you whether you anticipate any confidentiality issues. Um, typically, our applicants are based in um, areas of work where intellectual property considerations need to be taken into account. If you're working towards a patent on something or trade secrets that you're not allowed to reveal, um, as well as any confidentiality issues around managing people or if the nature of your work is fairly sensitive. So those in the defence sector, for example, um, need to, to consider this, or, or nuclear uh, chemistry there. So we've got the, the results of the poll here. 63% of you um, anticipate that you 
might have confidentiality issues. Uh, slim, 16%, don't think so, but then a, a reasonable 22% aren't quite sure. And we would say if you weren't sure about confidentiality issues, you should first check if that evidence is suitable to use with your mentor. Do not send it in to us for us to check because you might be inadvertently um, breaking some confidentiality requirements on, on your behalf or your employer's behalf. So always check it with your mentor. And this is, again is another reason why it's good to have a mentor who is very familiar with your work so they can be in a position to check whether it's OK for you to use evidence or not. Um, you can imagine if they were outside of your workplace, they might not have the security clearance or agreements to be able to review that evidence on your behalf. So there are lots of ways around the confidentiality issue. Um, here you can see I've just put some X's in, so you can redact things. Obviously, if there's more X's than there is words, that's not a good thing. Um, and we can enter into a confidentiality agreement should that be necessary. But in general, I think if you look at the kind of attributes we're asking, I would suspect most people could find a lot of stuff that's in the public domain that they could put in. But we will um, enter into confidentiality agreements if necessary. All our assessors are highly professional and work under terms of confidentiality anyway, as we do in the office. So hopefully there wouldn't be any concerns that way. So if we move on to A3, this is develop your chemistry and other professional skills. So here you can put in um, training certificates, um, PD, um, continuing professional development activities, um, copies of patents, copies of notes or web pages outlining projects you've worked on. Most people tend to put training certificates in here. Um, and evaluate critically and draw conclusions from scientific and other data publications list, a copy of relevant presentations, sections of reports, um, um, bits of papers, bits of <laughs> copies of the conclusions part of a paper, um, that sort of thing. I think it's also worth uh, just reiterating at this point that whilst attribute A generally covers the chemistry and the scientific nature of your work, um, you don't have to necessarily show those sensitive details of the technical reports. So as Kim quite rightly says, you can redact those elements or just not include them there. So we've got some an example of a training certificate. Um, and as you can see, I've labelled it attribute number, my name's on there, <laughs> and the date's on there. So I can see that this date is the 25th of February 2015. Would that be acceptable using evidence from as far back as February in 2015 or, or even older? So we deliberately left this in just to demonstrate that the assessors will be looking for dates. Now, February 2015 is obviously more than two years ago. If this had come in in March or April, they probably would let that go. But as we're now nearly December, they would probably ask for something more recent. Um, they are quite strict about the two year rule. Um, well, give or take a month or so. Um, so this probably would be picked up and you would probably be asked for something more recent on this one in this in this case. And uh, why is that important that it's from within the last two years? This is because you need to show that you're keeping up to date with all your knowledge. It's about professional development and remaining professional and up to date in your field. So we have a little tip for you in your report form. When you're using the training certificate, make sure you describe what the certificate's for. Why did you do it? Did it have any impact? and relate it back to the attribute. So not just a random certificate, but why did you go on the course? What did you learn from the course? What do you do as a difference from that course? If we move on to the B section, these are, remember are the professionalism um, competencies. So for B1, 
um, often people put in copies of confidentiality agreements and you can have an email trail from a client or a colleague or evidence of mentoring or supervising one or more colleagues or maybe um, a work experience person or um, a PhD student. For B2, we can have copies of proposals for projects, um, documents showing how you manage your workload effectively, minutes from project meetings or reports produced during your involvement outlining your involvement within a project. B3 is demonstrate the ability to work as part of a team. Um, often people put in minutes from team meetings outlining the role that they play within a particular project or activity. You can put in reports that have been authored by yourself, um, maybe in a team of others. Um, notes or emails can be put in. Or often there's correspondence to show participation at maybe a science fair or a careers fair where you're a part of a team. Again, we have a bit of a, an example for you. So again, this is quite a trivial example and we would expect it to be a little more than this, but this is just to show you how to present it. If you're using an email, you will see that we've got the attribute num number there. We've got the from, we've got the to, we've got a subject, we've got a date, we've got the text, and we've got the sign off from the person sending it. I have another tip for you. Um, in your report form, you need to describe the context of the email, um, what impact that communication had, what did you do as a result of it, why did you get it, and again, you must relate it back to the attribute. In addition to including emails, it is okay if you edit an email trail. So if you have several emails ping-ponging between you and the recipient, um, there's no need to include at the bottom all those messages that tell you to think about the environment before printing this email or any other corporate messages that um, can clog up the bottom of an email trail. Um, when you edit and, and trim out some of those emails or earlier emails which might not be important to the point, so if it was a particularly long trail, maybe 20 email exchange, we wouldn't need to see all of that and your mentor will provide assurance um, that they have can attest to the origins of this evidence that you haven't just made it up. So don't worry about editing elements of that email trail. The important thing is, as Kim says, is to make sure it shows how you have demonstrated the attribute really clearly. So if we move on to the C competencies, um, if you remember, these are the communication competencies. Um, so for C1, most people put in a presentation, can put in a publication list. Um, I would advise you to put in at least the front page of your most recent pa published paper if you do that. Um, reports authored by you, um, copies of written teaching aids or any documentation used for schools outreach or similar activities. For C2, which is the discuss work convincingly, um, Correspondence between yourself and customers relating to a recent project, maybe a presentation you've delivered which um, contributed to a discussion or a debate, minutes from meetings where you've outlined new procedures, or testimonial evidence to show you're a trusted expert in a particular field. Um, that testimonial, as we've said before, cannot come from your mentor, at least come from somebody else. For the exert effective influence, um, a project proposal that you've authored, documentation relating to the new technology or mythology you've implemented, um, presentations outlining suggestions for improvements to procedures, testimonial evidence or minutes from a meeting. Some people here put in a little bit of an email trail showing, showing how they've um, maybe advised somebody, uh, maybe changing a solvent in a, in a particular reaction and the other person has responded with, thank you very much, that worked, or maybe they've um, uh, mentored a student and they've got a thank you email and they're showing saying thank you for the mentoring and um, I did well in my exams or something along that line. I think it's worth adding at this point as well um, that if you do include things such as a project proposal or a business plan you only should include the ones that are successful um, to show that you have influenced well. Yeah that's a good point Nelly. Um, I have another little um, example here. So if you're using a presentation, again, it's labelled, 
we've got the date, we've got the title, we've got my name. Now this isn't the whole presentation, you'll see I've put six slides on one page. Again, this is how you can cut down some pages. So I can see on these slides here, the text is a, a bit fuzzy because it's been reduced so much and, and it's a bit hard to read. Would this be acceptable in a portfolio? So again, this was used for, to put in here for an example. You need to bear in mind the assessors will be looking for it to be easy to read. They need it to be clear and they need to be able to negotiate it, navigate it well. Um, I personally would think this was too poor quality to put in and I would probably reduce this down to maybe just four slides on a page to make them slightly bigger and easier to read. And again, the date is too, too old on this one because it's February 2015 as with the other one. So they would look at that as well. But yes, if you can't read it, the assessors can't read it and they're not going to want to start expanding on their screen in order to read it. So if you can't read it as it stands, you either have to put in a bigger version of it or think of something else. We've also seen portfolios where people include a link to something that might be online instead of actually showing the uh, particular piece of evidence. Are providing links acceptable? No, we don't want any more work be put on the assessors than reading the portfolio. It should be a straightforward process for the assessors. That's what they're expecting. If they have to go online and look up links, they're not going to do that. You need to either put in a summary of that link, put in um, a screenshot of what the link leads to, something like that, but don't just put in the link. They're not going to go and open links. So I have another uh, tip on the report form. If you're using a presentation, Again, describe the context of the presentation. Who did you give it to? Why did you give it? Um, what was the impact of giving this or organising the talk? And again, relate it back to the attribute. For the D competency, which is the one about environmental health and safety matters, Again, I would emphasise it does say in your role, so you must relate it to your role. So don't panic if you don't work in a lab. You will be involved in health and safety somewhere along the line in your role, I'm sure. People can put in evidence of implementation of learning outcomes um, from in-house or external training. Um, contribution to department HSC committee. Certificate of training, for example, maybe you're a fire warden or you might be a first aider. Uh, a near miss investigation, maybe a cost risk assessment, or maybe you've given a presentation on HSE. Um, for example, a teacher or a lecturer might just put in um, the, the safety requirements that you tell um, the pupils before you start a demonstration. Is it enough that I, uh, in the report form, mention that I wear my lab coat and and uh, the appropriate amount of PPE do my regular um, experiments. Would that be enough evidence for D? No, um, you need to actually be doing something active towards health and safety. So you are looking at um, training others in health and safety, being on a health and safety committee. We're looking for you to be very aware of health and safety and actually participate in it. What do you do beyond wearing the lab coat? So section E is about demonstrating an interest in broader developments in the chemical sciences that make a contribution to the profession outside your usual job remit. And it, it's those final words that are the crucial bit outside your usual job remit. So if you go on a conference um, on asymmetric synthesis and that's what you work in, that would not count. If you go on a conference on nanotechnology and you work in asymmetric synthesis, that would show that you're demonstrating broader interest. The things that people put in are emails or letters showing involvement in outreach, shadowing, mentoring. There can be involvement with um, a chemistry fair or chemistry week or something like that. You may be involved in Royal Society of Chemistry Networks. Um, you may have documentation to show your involvement in committees of science related bodies or interest groups which are not related to your work. Um, or there might be significant contribution to a chemical science publication such as a blog. Um, it may be that the committees of science that you're on are in your area of work, but you don't need to be on those committees for your work. 
Do you have any advice for candidates who want to be chartered if perhaps they um, have got caring responsibilities or the nature of their work means that they don't have much opportunity to get involved with outside external outreach type activities for Attribute E? So I would um, suggest if that is the case that you have a look and see what's on in your area um, maybe there is, is um, an RSC network you can join, maybe you can go to a local talk. Um, or sometimes we also accept things like lunch and learn that you do, maybe you present on your work to a different department, or maybe um, you could organise a school's day to come into work um, and have a look around your lab, something like that. So should we talk about mentors? So what about your mentor? What does he have to do or she have to do? Your mentor will need to review your evidence and written statements for each attribute. They will need to provide their own supporting statements on the final report form for each group of attributes A, B, C, D and E. It's not sufficient for them just to write, I agree. They have to make comments. They need to reference what you have written and provide support of your evidence and testimonials. And this is the person who will make the first recommendation for you to become CCAN. So once you've done it all, how does it all fit together? We ask you to collate your evidence into one PDF of no more than 40 pages. It must include evidence for all 12 attributes and any contents page or cover pages for your evidence that you wish to put in. This PDF should then be sent along with a PDF of the final report form to CCAN at rsc.org. And that's it. Are there any questions? So we've had a number of questions come through. One that I want to particularly look at is uh, how do you manage evidence if projects are not able to be publicly disclosed? So as Kim mentioned, in response to that question you can of course redact elements of the evidence and that's internally signed off your end by the relevant parties um, I would also urge the candidate to consider another piece of evidence as Kim mentions the words chemistry or chemical sciences only appears in four of the 12 attributes and so the majority of the attributes are looking at other aspects of your work and usually these things um, aren't necessarily as sensitive that said, I'm usually told by my colleagues where we accredit training and development in industries such as nuclear and defence that it's the, the chemistry is usually OK to show or share, but what is not OK is the application of the chemistry or the particular projects on which people are working at. So that would need an element of um, redaction there or simply including an extract of the evidence which isn't as sensitive. So we have um, a few more questions we can answer here. Um, one is that uh, will we be doing a similar presentation on chartered scientists? Uh, we weren't planning on doing this. Um, the chartered the the general principles behind the chartered chemist also apply to chartered scientists. So again, you have to put on the form what you have done. Um, the evidence has to be dated. It has to be relevant. Um, so the general principles are the same, although the attributes are slightly different. Um, if you have any particular questions about any of the attributes for CSI, please email us. Another question that we've got um, is about how many times can you use a particular piece of evidence? So, for example, if I have a presentation, how many attributes can I use that for? So one piece of evidence can be used for more than one attribute, but you do need to have one or two examples for every attribute. Um, mostly people tend to use just one piece of evidence for each attribute, but it, it is fine to use one piece of evidence for more than one attribute. I probably wouldn't advise you to use one piece of evidence for more than three attributes. And that's a really effective way of trying to get lots of different types of evidence to reflect the um, 
all the different aspects of your role. That's not the same as to say if you work on one project, you can only use evidence from that one project or not. And um, that's not true. So if you worked on one project, that might generate a technical report, a presentation, a business case, some emails, and maybe a testimonial if it's a significant piece of work. And so there you have five different pieces of evidence that you can get, use for a variety of attributes. Um, so just bear that in mind. It's not one project per attribute. It's one piece of evidence per attributes. So we've got a few more questions here. Um, one that I want to draw on is if an applicant is unsuccessful, um, do they get feedback to improve for the next time? And the uh, and simple answer is yes. Um, usually when an applicant submits their portfolio, it goes through an internal review in the office. Uh, by RSC staff and that's the first opportunity where we can usually identify any glaring uh, omissions or errors on your part or things that you need to tweak to get better and then we can come back to you with that feedback and say we think the assessors will pick up on these areas you might want to use a different piece of evidence or just write it in a different way. Um, if however it gets through to the assessment panel and the decision is a, a no that is a decision which is usually no not now because they either need a bit more evidence or you need to go away and work on something maybe produce something for attribute e um, every resubmission is considered discreetly for the first time um, so it doesn't matter how many times you attempt to go for it and we won't sort of consider those previous attempts we review everything um, unbiased every time it gets submitted so you don't have to worry about that and you will of course get clear feedback at every instance so we have some additional questions here um, let's look at one um, so a particular evidence is available for a particular attribute such as helping out in risk assessment, training or conferences. Can a reference contact information be attached um, and is that sufficient? Uh, no, I would, I would expect you to have a testimonial for that rather than just putting the contact in. We would not then contact the referee just to ask specifically about one attribute. But you could ask that person to write you a testimonial which must then, of course, be on headed paper and be signed and dated by that person. Another question that has come through, um, if they are doing the, uh, the PDP or the direct route, um, are they limited to the last two years of evidence if they go direct rather than PDP? Yes, all your evidence, whichever route you take, has to be within the last two years. There is, um, there's absolutely no exception to that rule. Another question that we've got is around security. Um, and this question is, do we have any security cleared assessors? And generally the answer is no, that's not something that we um, uh, manage their, what the assessors are is that they're banned by the requirements of the Royal Society of Chemistry. So if a non-disclosure agreement is set up between the RSC and you as a, an employee of your organisation, then uh, all assessors and everyone else that comes into contact with your evidence will be bound by that. If, however, you are in a particularly security uh, conscious line of work um, we do have other ways to get around that as we work in um, defense such as at DSTL or AWE we're able to go on site and review evidence there or conduct an interview so even though you might not be able to share particular aspects of your work it doesn't mean that you cannot get chartered chemist um, we have ways around that and, and if you anticipate any such problems we would recommend that you get in touch with us and then we can work out a way in which to get that assessment conducted of, for you for chartered chemist so we have another question here if you uh, use the development route can you submit before the end of two years this is a very interesting question I'll hand over to my colleague Kim to answer that one 
so in general the answer to that question is no um, the PDP is designed to help you develop your career it's not merely to show that you're at the level of a chartered chemist um, and most people who go through this route actually do find it does help them it focuses their mind on what skills they don't have and where they need to improve and it also gives them a little bit of leverage with their management to ask them to um, get specific training um, there are a few very few uh, occasions where we might consider taking it early um, we have for example um, if you're very near the end and you're about to move jobs or perhaps there's mention of redundancy we might consider it under those circumstances but if you have a particular reason for asking that question please get in touch so I have another question that's the opposite of that one um, can I so for the direct you said that I've got a year to submit can I take longer than a year to submit my portfolio if for example um, I need to take a break for any reason during that time so my answer will apply to both PDP and the directory you can take a break at any time you need to tell us so that we don't chase you for it um, and when you restart you need to tell us um, and the important thing here is if you take a break your evidence still needs to be within the last two years so you need to bear that in mind so if you're halfway through and some of your evidence is already close to that two years and you decide to take six months out which might put some of that evidence six months beyond the two years you will have to put new evidence in for that Again, if you have a specific query on that, please contact us. So there's a, another question relating to the difference between chartered chemist and chartered scientist. You can obviously achieve both with the Royal Society of Chemistry. And this question is about, uh, can I use the same evidence for my chartered scientist application as the same for my chartered chemist, if I so wished? Uh, you can but you would be best advised to make sure that the evidence you use for your chartered chemist application still fulfills the requirements for chartered scientists the attributes are quite different um, and so you would probably need to relate the evidence in a slightly different way when you fill in the form we've got one final question that i think we'll take today you've been very good very active we just like uh, what we'd like to see. This final question is about um, going for the registered scientist designation before starting a chartered chemist uh, PDP application, so the development route. And uh, would we recommend it? And, and the straight answer is yes, we would. Um, candidates who are in the earlier part of their career who apply for registered scientist usually find that as the registered scientist application covers very similar areas just at that next level down of responsibility and autonomy that it provides an excellent stepping stone and development opportunity for them to start thinking about their work and the technical aspects of their work in the context of competency and capability um, sometimes we focus a bit too much on what methods we've been signed off on but actually forget that we've got lots of other skills that go into being an effective chemist too. So yes, we would recommend uh, most of our early career candidates to go for registered scientist before the chartered chemist two year route. And you can do that whilst you're still an associate member. So that's a handy stepping stone um, to, to work towards there. Um, all information for registered scientist along with chartered scientist and chartered chemist can of course be found on our web pages. So that we're going to wrap that up now. Thank you very much for listening. Um, we hope we've given you the definitive guide to Chartered Chemist and we hope to see applications from you soon. If you do have any questions, please remember that we're on the end of the mailbox um, and we can help you with any other questions that we haven't answered here today. Thank you.